Support for this program comes from Jazz on the Tube, the Internet's largest collection of free, streamable, classic jazz videos. From Miles Davis to Louis Armstrong, from Thelonious Monk to Duke Ellington, you'll find it all on jazzonthetube.com. Start your free subscription today. This is Ken McCarthy, and welcome to the Jazz on the Tube podcast series. As you know, we love to talk to artists who are also educators. This jazz world of ours requires a lot of education, and every year we have new young people getting interested in the music, and where do they go? How do they get the skills and the inspiration and the details they need to become jazz musicians? In my opinion, becoming a jazz musician may be one of the most challenging professions there is on earth. A doctor goes to school for four years, a lawyer goes for three, they get their degree, hopefully they keep studying, but when you're a jazz musician, you have to keep studying, and there's always a new tune to learn, and there's always a new arrangement, there's always new chords to master, chord changes, and it's just a never-ending practice, and that's one of the things that makes it so fascinating. One of the most impactful educators in our world of jazz is on the phone with us today, and we're very delighted to have him join us. If we were to calculate just on practical terms how many thousands and thousands and thousands of musicians, beginner and advanced, young and old, he's helped over the years all over the world, we have to put him in, in the running for one of the most impactful jazz educators of all time. Welcome, Jamie Abersol. So happy to have you with us. Thank you. Glad to be here. Jim, I'm going to ask you to tell the story of Play Along. I know you've, you've probably told it a lot in, in many different places, but if you don't mind telling it again. But before we do, I want to point out to everybody that Jamie is a National Endowment of the Arts Jazz Master, and this was given to him specifically in recognition of his publishing and education efforts. And as he tells the story, it's going to dawn on you how, how important a, a simple but powerful observation that he made once long ago was and and the impact it's had on, on all the people that are striving to learn and develop their jazz skills. So, Jamie, you're from the the, uh, the area around Indiana near, near Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, no, right? I'm right across the Ohio River from Louisville, Kentucky, in New Albany, Indiana. That's in oh, I'm sorry. I meant, I meant to say the other city. But so people want to locate you in the map, and you pretty much, that's been your home, where you were born, where you grew up, and, and, and where you still are today. Right. I live about a block from where I uh, grew up. Well, that's continuity for you. <laughs> it sure is. It's very unusual in the world today. Now, of course, Louisville was, is a jazz city, and I, I wonder how you got your first exposure to jazz. Well, I think my first exposure was by reading a sentence when I was very young, probably 12 or 13, in a magazine. I guess it was a music magazine or something, and it said jazz is the coming thing. And since Mom and Dad both played music, not really professionally, but we listened to records all the time. When we, we didn't eat a meal without my dad putting a stack of 78 records on the record player in the living room, and, and we, I listened to everything because I was a very slow eater. But anyhow, after I read that... <laughs> I said, well, I guess I better go check this jazz thing out because I've been playing piano for five years and I was playing banjo and I may have been into the saxophone. I can't remember. Uh, but I, I know I started the sax when I was about 12 years old, so that'd be sixth grade. But I just went down to the record store and I bought a couple of 78s. The guy probably, the salesman probably advised me what to buy. I got a Dixieland thing with Kid Ory and then I got a Duke Ellington Big Band and brought them home to listen to them and liked them and about 14,000 recordings later, we're talking. Wow. Wow. So it was a, it was a line by a writer that got you to, to pay attention to the, to the music. Oh, yeah. It said, jazz is the coming thing. That's the way I remember it. And I said, well, I, I'd better check this out. And very I very, pro with very progressive, progressively minded and, 
then of course the record store and I wish we had record stores like we used to in the old days but the record store became a very important resource for you to to begin your study which brings up which brings us really to your work which is that all over America and all over the world there are people in small towns medium-sized towns large towns they encounter jazz they fall in love and I think that's really the way to describe it and they want to be part of it and it's not necessarily so easy because part of being a jazz musician is learning to play the tunes and, and playing along with the rhythm section. How do you do that if you're in a small town or if you're in a country, let's say, that doesn't even have jazz? Yeah. Well, most people do it by playing with my play-alongs, and they've been doing it for uh, 51 years. So yeah, the play-along, I'm sorry, think, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm on a speakerphone. Go ahead. Okay, sure. The play-along is something that you created 51 years ago. For people that don't know what it is, and I'd be surprised if anybody in, in the jazz world didn't know, but, but if someone didn't know what a play-along was, tell us what it is and, and how you came up with the idea. Well, I think I started when I was about in the uh, sixth grade. My mom and dad bought a Hammond organ, and I remember coming home. My school was about two blocks away, elementary. And every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I came home at lunch to see if the organ had arrived. Of course, it hadn't. So on Friday, I gave up and stayed at school. And then when I got home at 3 o'clock, there was the organ. Well, I learned to walk bass lines on the bottom manual and play cards on the top. And I even made a little uh, real real tapes of some background music. And, and as I got older, up in my 20s, I guess I was about 67, I was 28 years old, I said, I think I'll make a play-along record because I'd like to have something to practice with, and I think other people would too. So we came out with volume one, but we didn't call it one because I hadn't planned on doing any more. <laughs> and I didn't even write a book to begin with. Once we got the records, I thought, wow, if somebody buys this record, you know, for three or four dollars, whatever they were back then, they're going to be upset because nobody's taking any solos, so I'd better write a book. So then I wrote a book. But that's how I got started from that organ that my mom and dad bought and just making these little tapes, reel-to-reel -reel tapes for myself to practice with. Wow, and for young people, this may seem like a joke to us, but we, I need to point it out. There, there used to be a thing called records, and they were, they were fairly, it was a fairly involved process to produce a record. It wasn't as, you, know, you couldn't just burn a CD on your, your computer or, or even duplicate an audio cassette if any of our young listeners even are aware of how that process worked. But for, for people that want to do some musical archaeology, just let's talk about the process of what you had to go through to manufacture a record in those days. It wasn't like it was is today. Mercy, the computer has really helped things. No, it was, uh, we recorded this piano, bass, and drums, the very first one in Bloomington, Indiana, where I was going to school to Indiana University. We went down one night when the store was closed, and the only reason we did it there was they had a good grand piano, and it was in tune. And I remember having to stop once or twice because the train, the train tracks were right <laughs> next to us, and the train would go through town, and we'd have to stop for a while and then start again. But once I made the record, I'm pretty sure I pressed 500 records at RCA in Indianapolis, and I can remember getting them. And a couple times they pressed them, and the speed on one side was a minor third. Uh, it was too fast. Mm. So my count off, instead of being one, two, three, four, it was like one, two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> I had to drive up to Indianapolis, take boxes of records up and show them these don't work. I had to take my record player up to my little web core and play to uh -huh. the lady. Of course, she didn't know what was going on. But then she got hold of somebody else and, and he said, oh, yeah, we've got the wrong plate and when we mastered that. And then when he told me that, my first thought was, wow, I wonder if we can do records in different keys if they use different plates or whatever. Uh -huh. But the, you know, once you start to play back then, if you make a mistake, say the track's going to be five minutes long, you make a mistake, you got to start all over. Because the, wow. the corrective factor really wasn't there. Wow. Wow. So, so did, did, you, did it actually work later to try to take the same song and yes. use different plates? Yeah, we, I, I re-recorded that volume one several times just going for better quality and better separation. As a matter of fact, today I just sent off volume 24, which is, I'm sorry, volume 49 called Sugar, with Hank Marr from Columbus, Ohio on the organ and Jim Rupp on the drums. And we recorded that years ago, but I just now sent it UPS up to Cincinnati because I was listening to it and I didn't like the mix. So these guys in Cincinnati will fix the mix and probably 
do exactly what I want them to do, and a couple of weeks from now when you send it back, I'll feel like I'll feel much better selling that volume 49 CD. But the process gotcha. has gotten so much easier now to fix things. Gotcha. For, for people that aren't musicians or aren't music students, what's the experience like? What somebody decides, gee, I want to play in the, let's say, Bossa Nova style, and gee, there's nobody around that I can play with, I'll go to jazzbooks.com and, and see what I can find. And what is it that they actually get, and how is it that they work with it that helps them develop their, music, their musicianship? Okay, let's say they're going to get volume 98, which has Dave Stryker on it and some other people, and they're playing Bossa Novas. Put the CD on, and the left channel is going to have the bass and the drums, and the right channel is going to have the uh, guitar and the drums. And, of course, if you don't have separation on your amp or whatever, you know, then it's going to be stereo all the way. And uh, I'll just, uh, there'll be a tuning note on the first track, maybe two. It might be a B-flat concert and an A concert. And each one of them sounds for about 30 seconds, and you tune your instrument up. And then if you go with the first tune, you open the booklet up. Let's say the first tune is girl, The Girl from Ipanema. And you, the book is divided into four sections. The first section is for concert instruments like piano, guitar, flute, and violin, say. And then the second section will have the same tunes in the same order, but they're transposed. Each tune is up a whole step for B-flat instruments like flugelhorn, cornet, trumpet, tenor saxophone, clarinet. And the third section of the book duplicates the same tunes again in the same order for alto saxophone and baritone sax. And then the last section of the book, there's four sections, is going to be your bass clef, and that's for the trombone and the bass. So we've covered all the instruments in one book. And I'll be honest, I always thought that was environment, environmentally harmful because most people <laughs> only use, say there's ten tunes in the book, so most people are just using 10 pages of the book and the other 30 pages wasted. So I've never felt good about putting all the parts together, but that's the way we had to do it because music stores, they wouldn't carry the product if you had to get four different books and try to guess which ones are going to sell. And then True. Once, I could, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, once they hear the count off on the girl from Ipanema, it would be something like one, two, a one, two, three, four, and the music starts. And there may be eight major introduction, and then... They dive into the song, and most people play the melody. Some people play the melody several times because they're not really adept at improvising, so they like playing that melody. And it'll play for maybe five choruses. It's like five chapters in a book, and each chapter is, the first chapter always has the melody, usually, and then you play four, chapter, uh, four uh, choruses where you're improvising. And if somebody's just getting started, I would not advise them to get volume 98. It'd be nice to listen to, but I doubt if they're going to be able to play with it if they're a rank beginning improviser. They need to do something like volume one, where we start off with just a couple scales, and the tempos are nice and slow, and ways to practice those scales in order to kind of invigorate your imagination and feel safe improvising on those tracks. So if you're a beginner, I would say most of my volumes wouldn't be for you. So where would a good place for a beginner to, to start with your with your books and pro, in exactly your programs? Yes, volume 24, which should have been oh. Volume 1, but started <laughs> in 1967, the idea of playing on one scale for education hadn't really caught on yet. So I waited some month, uh, years later, and a fellow up in uh, Massachusetts convinced me, Jamie, you need a track, you need a CD, maybe a couple of them, just major scales and just minor scales for four or five minutes. So volume 24 is a great place to start. And once you get started, then I'd move over to volume one. And something else I'd do is I would get my video. It's almost two hours long. And I did it in Brazil in 1992 down in Sao Paulo. And it's an excellent, uh, it has like three, four, and five minute segments on how to go about improvising. I'm sitting at a piano talking to you and showing you music. And I, I've had so many comments on that video and the comments are usually are to the effect of, boy, this has cleared up a lot of things for me. Now I kind of see what I'm supposed to do when I try to improvise. Yeah, because just think of how challenging it is to the, the beginning musician. They get the idea that they want to play jazz. They know that improvisation is a big part of it. But teaching improvisation, wow, that, what a challenge that is. Because your, your improvisation is composing on the spot 
and it requires in, in inventiveness and flexibility and freedom and knowledge and all these different elements and how on earth you convey that. So this, now this program that you're talking about, this video, you happen to make it in Brazil, but it's about improvisation in general, not just about Brazilian music, of course. Oh, no, it's just improvisation in general. Yes, we're talking, it's in English, and the fellow invited me down there, and he wanted me to do a video, and I said, well, I've never done that before. What if we do it? I don't like it. He said, well, then we won't put it out, but we'll still pay for your way to come down and do several clinics here. So I said, okay, but they did a marvelous job of editing that. Wow, well, and... Yeah. What a great, great thing. So you got, a, you got a trip to Brazil as well. Right. I'm talking about 10 days. Um, nice. My friend Wilson nice. Courier, who loved American jazz and was a marvelous piano player, I haven't heard from him in years, but anyhow, he edited it with his knowledge of English, and he did a fantastic job. Oh, great. So it, it's available in English, obviously, but oh, yeah. possible, is it, is it in, available in Portuguese too? I don't think so. I think it's just oh, okay. in English. Okay, so it's, it, it's a DVD. English language. Great. So as I look at your, your catalog, especially on the play, play-alongs, and of course your catalog is more than just play-alongs. You've got arrangements, you've got straight-up books, you've got DVDs and, and CDs and all kinds of things. But the play-alongs, is really interesting. They're broken down by category. So if somebody's interested in blues, you have a whole series of blues play-alongs if they're interested. We already mentioned Latin and bossa nova. If they like fusion, they can go the fusion route. If they're a singer or a vocalist, you can you, you have things for them. And you also have bebop, which, of course, is the gold standard. I mean, the real challenge for improvisers is, is to deal with bebop. Can you tell us a little about your own experience as a young guy confronting this challenge of improvising music and how you met it without the help of your own material? You had to figure it out yourself. Yeah, that's a good question. I guess I was supposed to go that route where I really didn't have a teacher, so to speak, and I had no intention of starting this business, that's for sure. I just wanted to do that volume one, which was called A New Approach to Jazz Improvisation. It really wasn't called volume one. I just wanted to have something to practice with, but it became so popular that we kept adding to it. Sure. I think I, way back there, I think I wanted to go to college to learn how to be a jazz musician so I could go to New York and someday make a Blue Note record. Uh-huh. But, I wanted to go to Manhattan School of Music. I wrote them. They wrote back after several months and said, Dear Mr. Abersow, we do not offer the saxophone. So that was the end of going to New York City for college. So oh. I went up to Indiana University, which is about 95 miles from my house, because I heard a fellow that was older than me who was going to school for music. I heard him in my kitchen telling my brother, Oh, they're jamming all the time at IU. Indiana University. So that's where I went. Of course, I got up there and found out they didn't know the saxophone either. But my jazz, <laughs> my jazz journey was really by listening to records. And when I got to college, I had a couple of friends that were kind of my age. And we would talk and try to figure out what's going on. As a matter of fact, last Saturday, I listened to the Jazz Messengers way back in 1956 with Donald Byrd and Hank Mobley, Doug Watkins, Art Blakey, and Horace Silver. And I had the CD on, which had the extended tracks. And I listened to the whole thing while I was working here in my basement, putting things away. And I realized one week ago how important that record was for me, harmonically, melodically, and improvisationally. Because I thought then that Donald Byrd and Hank Mobley could never play a wrong note, and I wondered how they did that. And they, they would never get in, even though the tunes were harmonically complex, they never got trapped in a corner. You know, they never hit a wrong note. I just couldn't figure out how they did it. Mm. So my process in learning how to improvise was very long. But at the same time, I was not spending four or five hours a day practicing. If I had, I think I would have been happier improvising at an earlier age. So I haven't really been a jazz man. That's been part of my life. Being the other of, part of good public, examples. Teaching, doing clinics, you know, publishing, so forth. I've had a really varied life. So part of your process as a learner was intense study of, of good examples. For instance, the Donald Byrd and Hank Mobley album. Yes. That was just one album. And the reason I mention that is it was only seven days ago when I played that and realized what an influence that had on me when I was 19 or 20 years old going to Indiana University. I just, That was like Bach or Beethoven to me. It was fantastic. Mm-hmm. You made an interesting point, too, when, when you're talking about getting together with your, your friends and 
you know, talking together about the music and trying to figure it out together. That's a that's a big part of of jazz. Always has been. Always will be. It certainly has been. And I think in 1965, the fellow that ran some big band camps, his name was Ken Morris from South Bend, Indiana, and he asked me to join his crew of teaching. It was big band camps. And I taught uh, sax sectionals uh, two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon. I got to hang out with people like Johnny Richards, Oliver Nelson, Ron Carter, Atila Zoller, Herb Pomeroy, John Laporta, a whole bunch of people. I was delighted to be there. But when I started actually doing these sax sectionals, I realized that some of these kids, they were all teenagers, usually boys, they knew nothing about improvising. So I asked the pirates to be, which would be like John Laporta, I heard Pomeroy, people like that. Hey, would it be all right if after supper it's just a week long camp that I play some records for the kids? Oh, yeah, Jamie, do whatever you want to do. Okay. Well, and then a little later, how about if I have a combo of some of the more advanced students? Sure, Jamie, after supper we've got a free hour or two. Do what you want to do. That evolved into the combo camps that we started in about 1971, 72, 3. And then it wasn't very long before Ken Morris, who was footing the bill for all of this, decided to stop the big band camps and just do combo camps because my my goal all along has been to allow encourage and allow everybody to improvise not just play the parts in a big band got you which which leads to your summer jazz workshops now those have been going on for quite a while now this is my 53rd year year and this is going to be my last year oh wow yeah the first two weeks of july and then come july the 13th we stop Okay. And they're going to be at the University of Louisville campus? Right, yeah. And our enrollment is way up from this same date last year, or any year. So I think the word is out that this is Jamie's last year. And if you want to go, if you've been putting it off, if you've been a chicken, this is the year to come. <laughs> well, and I've heard that the piano, the piano section is, is sold out already. Already sold out. We've got a waiting list, and we're trying to figure out, and we're doing it how to accommodate probably another 15 or 20 people. Wow. And by the way, we're just for listeners, we're recording this in March, so we're talking about something sold out many, many months in advance. Now, you made, you made an interesting comment there, don't be chicken, because it takes some bravery to stand up there with your, with your instrument and create on the spot. How do you help people get over that, that natural, understandable fear? Well, I think it started with me way back there, or maybe even before we started the combo camps. I was teaching at my house here, and instrumental saxes, clarinets, flutes, and then I did some trumpet on because they wanted to learn jazz. And I learned right away that just letting people play by ear wasn't going to make it. So I started writing out the songs for them to play and the scales that went with the songs. So we're talking about way back in the 60s. And I found out if I wrote out the scales and pointed them out to them, and then asked them to go practice them for a week, come back next week, we'll play this tune again. And sure enough, they'd come back, and it sounded much better than the first week, because I'm giving them the tools, which are your scales and your arpeggios, to each of the voicings, each of the chords on the tune. And then at the jazz camps, when we started that, I I started putting um, transparencies up on the screen during the evening faculty performances, and I'd point along. To the tune. If we're playing the girl from Ipanema, you'd see my pencil pointing to the melody. Once the melody's over and, say, Dave Liebman starts to take a solo or Chris Potter or Randy Brecker, these are people who have been to the camp, my pencil would be pointing out where they are in the harmony. And I think this, this idea of giving them some visual information really transformed this whole idea of teaching jazz. Wow, what a golden idea. And again, like the play along, it's just, it's very simple and it's very obvious once somebody does it the first time, but somebody had to be first to do that. That's, that's brilliant because, yeah, I mean, part of the problem is people get lost. Sure. They literally get, they literally get lost. So with, the, with that visual guide that's ongoing, they can always at least know where they are. Even if they don't know what to do, <laughs> at no. least they know where they are. Well, um, I thought early on, the two things that kept people from trying to improvise were they, they were afraid to play a wrong note, and then the other thing was what you just mentioned. What if I don't stop at the right time? What if I get lost? Oh, my gosh, that's like falling off a cliff, and everybody's watching. <laughs> right. That, that's why I say there's a, there's a lot of courage involved. And, 
and and I it's interesting. I was I was watching the old Ken Burns jazz DVDs, and they had a whole disc that started with the premise that hey, every night, no matter who you are, you might be. In fact, they used Dexter Gordon as an example, and they used Sonny Rollins as an example. It doesn't matter whether you're rich and famous and known all over the world. When you step on that bandstand, you've got to produce something new right. on the spot. Yep. And that's so that's ongoing courage. It never, it never, you can never coast. I think that's what makes jazz as a profession one of the most impressive professions there are. I don't, I just, I, I wish every profession had continuous education straight through for decades <laughs> after you get your initial degree. Well, tell me about uh, more about these workshops. Who would be a qualified person to come to as a student to your workshop? Well, I think let's say you're an instrumentalist like sax, trumpet, something. You, you really need to have played your instrument for a year or two. That helps. Okay. Okay. If you haven't, then I've always said this: you probably shouldn't come to the camp. You should take that money and take private lessons from a good teacher in, in your hometown. Okay. But let's assume they've played a year or two. And maybe they've been afraid of coming, or maybe their band director has told them to come, etc. Once they come, they have a short audition for three or four minutes, and everybody's nervous with the audition. But basically, the teachers, the faculty that's doing the audition, they've been doing it for years, so they know what to look for. And if you were to play blues, there are certain notes they would be listening for to see if you hit in order to really know the blues. Or are you just sort of skating across? Do you stop uh, stop at the right time, you know? Are you playing what you hear in your head? Or are you just are, or are you just letting your fingers uh, mm-hmm. run around over the keys? So, And then we have places for everybody. We have places for people that think they can improvise, but they really can't. And all along the way, we're giving them encouragement. And you might have a combo that has piano, a bass, and drums, and maybe a guitar, two saxes, and a trombone. Or you might have another group, which, which is a basic group. We call them record combos because they will not be playing with a live bass player, drummer, and piano or guitar because they don't need beginning bass, drum, and guitar hindering their progress. So we use a play-along and a teacher that's used to using them, and they might have, say, four trumpets, and they'll play. And what we found when we do the play-along combos for the more beginning students when Friday comes around, they oftentimes sound excellent because they've had so much intensive training just on their instrument, and the, the faculty instructor of that combo has not had to spend any time working with the drummer, showing the bass player how to play the bass lines, working with the piano player on voicings, or the guitar player on voicings. In other words, they're getting individual. But they don't realize that that, that additional attention is going to make them sound better on Friday, and they're going to learn a lot more than if they're in a beginning combo where the faculty is maybe struggling a bit with just the rhythm section. And then gotcha. we, have so they... a, we have advanced combos, too. And, and you hear those people playing, you may wonder why they're at the camp. Why did they come? You know, they sound so good. Yeah, and so for the, the beginner, the beginning students, they can get right to it, as you point out. They don't have to, to worry about, you know, are the, are the bass player and drummer fumbling. They've got a nice, they've got a nice steady rhythm track going. And they can focus on, and the teacher too can focus on the playing. So when the students arrive, they get, they do their sort of their audition, and then you s- sort them out. Okay, you're sort of a someone at the beginning end of the process. You're sort of a middle person. You're kind of getting it, and then you're an advanced person. What diff- How many different levels are there within the camp? Oh wow, they go from zero <laughs> to advanced. They really do. Okay. They okay. really do. We might have 40, 45 combos. One wow. combo may have four people in it. They are beginning trombone players, let's say. And then the top combo might have nine people. And you might say, well, okay, nine's a little thick. Can you take one out? And we do if we can. But we say, no, they really need to be at that level working with whoever the combo instructor is at the high level. So and then we 40? have all levels in between. And it's also really interesting. So they have a rehearsal twice a day for two and a half hours hour and a half or from 11 to 12.30, and then again from like 3 to 4 or something like that. So they're in combo two and a half hours a day from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday, they have a shorter rehearsal because we're going to have concerts that afternoon. But the progress that can, people can make from Monday to Friday sometimes is, is really fantastic. And when you see them come off with a smile on their face after they just played Blue Bossa or a Blues or whatever, they know it's worth it. 
and, and they're on their way. And that, that's what we're trying to do is enthuse them, give them direction, give them motivation, give them things to practice, give them a list of LPs, excuse me, a CDs, recordings that they need to listen to. They may have listened to transcribed solos, and they've heard so much information in a week's time that they are ready to go. But we have all ages and all abilities. That's great. So what, what would be the youngest age that, that would work? Probably 10, 11, 12. Oftentimes they'll come with their parents, usually a father, sometimes a mother. And sometimes, okay. sometimes the parents take the course too. Okay. And the primary qualification, as you mentioned, is you've got to be familiar with your instrument. It, you know, if whatever that instrument is, you have to know how to play it <laughs> before you can learn how to improvise on it. Pretty much. It really, it really helps because otherwise it, it puts them at a disadvantage and us too because we really can't afford to have one person working with this person in combo. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you, so you have young kids, you have high school kids, college, and, and then adults. What kind of adults show up at this at the camp? We've got two people coming this time. They're 85, I think, and 86, and one of them has been here 26 times in a row. Wow. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 26 that... in a row. And I jokingly say, oh, the slow learner is back. <laughs> And so 86 is not too old to, to, to start making progress in your improvisation? No, no, not at all, not at all. Oh, that's just... Preach, I tell you, years ago, now this is my 53rd year of doing this, years ago, everybody was a teenager. And if we had, if you had 150 kids and you three of them were adults, that was a big deal. And as things grew a little bit, if you had 200 kids, and four adults, and one of those adults was a band director. That was a big deal. The band director got special attention because they're always mm -hmm. afraid to come to our camp. But things have flipped. In the last X amount of years, we have more adults than we have teens, and I'm not sure what the reason is. It may be that the adults are getting older and they see the end of their life coming and they still haven't done this camp thing. Mm -hmm. They're still trying to improvise. I wonder, and plus I think, a lot of the adults will read our advertisements and testimonials and so forth and feel, okay, well, if these people can do it, I'm going to do it. And I suspect this year there will be a whole lot of adults because this is our last year. And that, that raises an interesting point. You This not only attracts the beginning improviser, you're also attracting professionals. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Which is which is really an amazing concept that, that, that you, you've created this learning environment, this educational environment, where as long as you can play that instrument, even if you've never improvised a line, or if you're a professional musician or a professional educator or both, there's a place for you in this, in this camp process. Exactly. And I think it goes back to what you said at the beginning of this interview, where it's an ongoing process. You never get to the end. You never play the perfect solo, and if you do, it's only good for that day or maybe the next day, and then your mind is wondering what you could do next. You know, it's a challenge, and it's a journey, and, and it's really, really interesting. I've got stacks of letters. I was just reading one here the other day. A guy was writing about how his friend was in the Navy, and he's under the polar ice cap with his flute, and he's playing along with my play-along records with <laughs> headphones. Fantastic. Well, let, let's talk about numbers. I mean, you've been at this for a long time. Do you have a sense of how many of these uh, play-alongs have been sold over the years total? Well, back in December the 8th, the local New Albany Carnegie Center for Art and History, uh, they have exhibits every two months, and they had an exhibit on me called Jamie Abrazo and Improvised Life. And so we had to do a little research to find out how many play-alongs we think we sold. Well, I think it was probably around 5 million. And Five? So are used wow. all around the world, and something that I really feel good saying is there's not a second of any day that goes by that somebody around the world isn't practicing or playing with one of my play-along tracks. They are so popular. What an image. So, yeah, because we have different time zones, and, and well, we're sleeping here in the East Coast or the, east, the eastern part of the United States. There's somebody maybe in China, wide awake, working through a tune with, with mm -hmm. books. I, I've been to uh, London. We had our camps over there for about 20 years. And the last time I was there was 2008. That's when the financial crash hit and we had to stop. But anyhow, like a year before that, I was teaching. Actually, I was free in the afternoon. And the guy running the program came up to me and said, Jamie, I want you to meet so-and-so. Uh, so I shook his hand and said, hi. He said, I represent all of these musicians that are playing in the subways and out on the streets. 
and using your play-along records to make a living. A majority of them are from the Eastern Bloc. And he said, I'm here on behalf of them to tell you thank you for putting out these play-alongs so people can play them to make a living. They call it busking. Out on mm-hmm. That really touched me because I'd never really thought about a little CD as being an object that could make somebody a living. What a beautiful thing. No, I, I, who, who would have thought of that? And, and all, that's the interesting thing about publishing. You, 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 you make your best effort. You put it out there. And you really, until people tell you, you really don't know all the different ways they're using it. I wonder, you, you must have some illustrious grads, you know, people that started with you young, either at the camp or through the, the play along, who then went on to a, careers as, as professional jazz musicians. Yeah. We do have actually quite a few. Uh, Chris Potter is an excellent example. I met him at a IAJE convention in Kansas City many, many years ago. And I, I was so impressed with his ability to improvise at the age of 12, I think it was, on his alto saxophone, that I went and I asked, his dad was with him, and I said, do you mind if I interview your son? So I went up to their hotel room and interviewed him. And I expect hmm. to say, well, I practice four hours a day. You know, he's only 12. And I listen to records all the time. Well, that wasn't the case at all. So I've kind of followed him. Of course, he's now, what, 45, 50 years old? I don't know how old he is. But he's a, a really good example because he came to the camp several years. Uh, Chris Bodie came to the camp. Got Winhold came to the camp. There's a long list. I just can't think of the names right now. But sure. it's amazing how many people came to the camp. As a matter of fact, I was doing a... A clinic, a couple of clinics at the Purdue Jazz Festival back in January. They had, gee, 200 bands? I don't know. I saw buses everywhere. Anyhow, I went into one clinic, and God was, he's a trumpet player. I won't mention his name, but he was telling the students how when he was young, he wanted to really learn how to play trumpet. And uh, somewhere along the line in high school, a friend of his was a drummer, and the drummer had come to our camp up in Illinois, and he told this guy, he said, you got to go to the camp. So anyhow, he went to the camp. He was telling all these people, and he said, I remember, because I went three or four years in a row. First year, I was barefoot every day. But he said, that Woody Shaw came in, and Joe Henderson, in the middle of the week, as special guest. And he said, I could not believe it. Anyhow, and I'm standing over on the wall listening to him talk, but he doesn't know I'm in the room. <laughs> and he says, those weeks changed my life, and that's why I'm here today. The Abyssal mm-hmm. Camp got me started in the right direction. And he looked over, and he saw me, and uh, he said, oh, Jamie, I didn't know you were there. It was a very emotional moment for me, standing there with 100 kids in the, sitting in the room listening to this fellow talk about his experience about how the camps changed his life. He's a professional musician now and has been for years. So you just never wow. know. Wow. And even the, the play-alongs, which you'd think, well, okay, th- that's good for kids and people just learning, but I, I, you, you probably can't mention any names, but... You, you've had some pretty well-known musicians buy those play-alongs, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, I can tell you one. Randy Brecker practices with him every day. Uh, Bill Evans, a saxophone player, he practices with him every day. As a matter of fact, he's, he's going to be at our camp, I think, this year. But Bill Evans wrote me a year or so ago and said, could you send me another volume 71? That's the real fast one called Burning. All the temples are fast. He said, I practice with that every day, but I've worn out the CD. Yeah, I think we'd all be surprised who has used the practice the CDs to practice with, like before jobs. A- after all, them famous people, they can't just snap their finger and have a piano, bass, and drums in their living room to practice with. But it's right. easy to and, put a along on. Right, and, that, and that's one of the things, too, about being a, a jazz musician. You've got to practice. I was talking with the widow of Dexter Gordon a couple of weeks ago, and she was just, we were talking about a lot of different things, and she said, oh, people always ask me, well, what did Dexter, how was, what was Dexter like at home? And, you know, she said, well, he liked certain TV shows and he liked this, and, but he practiced all the time. <laughs> and, you know, to be at that level, there's, you've got to practice. And what are you going to do, just take your horn out and play by yourself? I mean, you, you can do that, and that's part of, the, a part of practice, of course. But what if you want to work on a tune? You, as you just, Jamie just point, can't, you know, call up a, a trio like you can call up a pizza. <laughs> But thanks to this play along, you can do it. You can do it. So, t- so about the, these workshops, the, I have one other question. So, you say this is the last year. So, it's the last year that you're going to participate, or the last year ever for the the uh, workshops? I, this is the last year for me doing these week long workshops. Now, I, I'm looking forward. I think 
to maybe doing some where I do them by myself. We call them a two-day workshop, which incidentally I do this year too. The first Saturday and Sunday, which ah. I, I do a two-day, the first two days of the workshop. Yes, and we also on the Saturday and Sunday of each weekend we have bass, guitar, and drum special workshops, which prepare you for the combo week coming right after that. And we have a lot of people sign up for those. But I do my own two-day where I'll have maybe 60, 70, 80 people in a room for Saturday and then Sunday up to about 3 o'clock. And then on Sunday, the auditions start. Actually, they've already started, and we go from there. But this is my official last year of doing these week-long workshops. Who knows what will happen next year. We may improvise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, it's it's such an important institution you know, as as is all the play-alongs that exist and all the the publications that you know your company's produced over the years. I mean, they 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 literally are an institution. And you know, when fans are in a club or at a festival and and they're enjoying music, I I always tell them enjoy the music for sure. And also, just have in the back of your mind what a commitment and an education process these men and women have gone through to be able to stand on that stage. And then think about the educators and, and the communities, uh, and you, which is what you created with the uh, jazz workshops, the communities that make these musicians possible. Because nobody can be alone in a room <laughs> learning this. They, they have to get out. They have to work with other musicians. They have to have opportunities to make mistakes in public. They have to get encouragement. I think everybody needs encouragement, but I think especially in such a challenging field. So this has been a theme for us in all the Jazz on the Tube podcasts is is to encourage people who may not be musicians and maybe, maybe they'll never be musicians but I think it adds greatly to their appreciation to know not only is the music exciting and interesting and beautiful but it's the product of beautiful community of of educators and lovers of this music who, who push it forward and you know Jamie I have to say you know where, where would we where would jazz be t today without you I think we, we would be missing a huge piece and your, your contribution to, to this world of jazz is, is kind of incalculable. You know, you know uh, well, just hearing you say what you just said took me way back, 50 years. And I'm out in Colorado, Greeley, Colorado, University of Northern Colorado. We're doing a week-long camp. And I'm using a chalkboard to put up scales and theory and, and describe stuff. Okay? And a fella comes in the room. It might have been Gene Aiken who ran the program at the time. He said, Jamie, I want to show you something. Come down the hall. So I go down the hall, and he shows me an overhead projector and a transparency. He said, you can do this on this, and you don't have to use all that chalk. And I said, well, how do you make these transparencies? He said, well, you run them through a copy machine. Now, copy machines were relatively new in the 60s. And I said, oh, okay. Or this might have been 70s, all right? So I got that figured out, and everywhere I went, I asked for an overhead projector. They were in every classroom then. But, and I made transparencies. I've got thousands of transparencies that I still use. But I got some flack. This is what I'm leading up to. I got some flack from some other jazz musician educators who felt like I was giving away too much by having people look at the overhead projector, and I was also Xeroxing some stuff back then. You're giving them too much stuff, Jamie. If they can't get this by their ear, then they don't need to be playing jazz. And I said, well, okay, that's your opinion. And when I put the overhead projector and screen up, over on the side of the stage for the evening concerts, I can still remember one person saying, Jamie, don't put that up there, man. That's distracting. I can't play with that up there. And I thought about it for about a half a second, and I said, then don't look at it. <laughs> this is for the people in the audience. This is for the people that have no idea what you're playing or what the farm is. They haven't played these tunes before, but sometime when I put the chord progression on the screen with the melody, and I'm going to even point along so they can keep their place for a couple choruses, and then I'll stop and see if they can keep their place. And then I'll come back in and point again. And this is part of the educational system. We're going to use our eyes as well as our ears, and we're going to encourage them all along the way to memorize this stuff. And that's a key word, memorization. Jerry Coker spoke of that. He said that's one of the key components of improvising is memory and the use of a memory in a way that such in a way that it uh, doesn't stymie your imagination, it gives you courage to your imagination when you start to play a solo. You have courage because you 
You know where you're going to stop before you even start. You don't know exactly what you're going to play, but you're prepared because you got your scales and your arpeggios to this particular song under your fingers, and you basically can't wait to play. And what happens if you make a mistake? You just keep going. You mentioned something about certain jazz professionals and <laughs> and not them maybe not wanting to give away too much. I think every profession can have a tendency towards elitism. In other words, hey, we don't want to make it too easy <laughs> yeah. for the new guys. That's one attitude, you know. And hey, you know, I understand. I guess somebody works hard to get a certain sound or a certain thing. Maybe they don't want it, everybody else to have it. But then the other side of of that is not elitism. I don't know what the word for not elitism is, but but de- well, democrat a democratic view of jazz, yeah. which says, hey, let's open the door as wide as possible. Let's let everybody in that's willing to work a little bit and apply themselves. Let's give them every possible tool. Let's lift them up. And that seems to me the approach that you've taken consistently, and it, and it just shows in everything, the workshops, the play-alongs, and, and everything else you've done. We, we played at a place in New Army here a couple of weeks ago, and it was a Saturday night, and it was totally packed. So a couple of my friends came in, and they got in line, and then they started to head for the door. And I walked around and said, what's the matter? He said, well, they don't have any more tables. You had to have a reservation. My brain, the first thing my brain said was, is the last thing we want to do is not have people listen to jazz. Now, mm-hmm. let's, let's find some tables. Let's get some chairs. Don't let these people go out of here, <laughs> you know. So I've, I've been promoting this for a long time, gee. And, that, and that, that particular night was just from a listener's view. The people that wanted to listen were not really musicians or anything. But your idea about being democratic is extremely important. And I think many years ago, Jazz musicians kind of like the idea of it being an exclusive society, something they could do that other people couldn't do. And I've tried, well, I think, I've tried sorry, to help uh, do away with that. Uh, like David Baker says, we try to demystify jazz. And I think that approach grows the marketplace for performing musicians. I think, you know, for instance, if somebody's learned a little bit of improvisation, maybe they're not going to be a professional, maybe they do it for fun, but they're going to be the most enthusiastic concert goers, festival goers, club goers, they're going to buy CDs, they're going to be educated, educated fans. So it really, it, it's something that lifts all the boats, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a good thing. And I, I want to just go on, touch on one last thing and then, and then we'll go. Way back when you mentioned, of course, when, when jazz education was new, it was primarily guys, you know, it, it was a guys thing. But I've noticed from watching some of the high school bands that show up here in New York at the uh, essentially Ellington competition, there are a lot of fantastic young ladies playing jazz now. Can you comment on that? Oh, yeah. We used to have more ladies than we have now. I don't know what's going on. And I've always mm. tried to include women in our faculty, uh, but like you say, the faculty that teach jazz is primarily mm-hmm. males, period, across America. But we, have, we do have women, yes, but we just don't have as many. Well, our whole team in Roma has gone down gradually over the last 10 years. I'm not mm. sure what the reason is. But, of course, mm. when the teens go down, the women go down, too. You know, we have quite a few adult women that come to the camp. It's interesting that we're talking about this. Mm-hmm. Balance, flutes, saxophones, and some mm-hmm. of them might be 50, 60 years old. Mm-hmm. And we don't think much about that. You know, I don't think anybody ever says, how come we don't have more women as students here? Mm-hmm. I haven't heard anybody say that, but it, it, we, we invite everybody to come. And some of the combos might have somebody that's 70 years old and somebody that's 15 years old. We try to place them in the combos, which we didn't really talk about that, by their ability rather than their age. Mm. And that, that seems to work. I was going to say something else, too. About a month ago, we played a, my quartet played down at Elizabethtown, Kentucky, okay, at a community college. And we played there every year right before Valentine's Day. And a guy tells me that we're going to be over in the, in the science building, a small auditorium. And I'm thinking, uh-oh, we've never been there. There won't be anybody there this year. Well, we had about 75 or 80 people, and it was some mm-hmm. kids. It was a real, real nice stage. Some kids kind of walking around, they were like one and two years old, kind of running in front of the stage. So everything got really loose, and for some reason, once we first started the first tune and the piano player was taking the solo, I took the microphone and talked over the music, explaining what was going on. Steve's taking his solo now. Now listen to Tyrone on the bass. He's going up and down the scales. You'll notice he doesn't have a music stand, and he's not playing something that's memorized. He's improvising on the spur of the moment and accompaniment to the piano. Now listen to the drums. See, he's using the sticks on the cymbal. Oops, do you hear him hit the bass drum there? 
So I talked through each tune just a little bit. I didn't get in the way of the solos. When we got through, it was one of the best concerts we ever gave. And the guy in charge, who was in charge of the humanities there at the school, he came up and he said, you know, that was great that you talked to these people because I felt like when they left, they left with some knowledge that they didn't have before they got here. And I said, well, it just felt so natural to do it. So that, that was a good one. I really liked that concert. And I even told the audience, I said, these kids don't bother me at all. As a matter of fact, when I see them running around here, it makes me feel as a jazz musician that I can play just about whatever I want to play. <laughs> and, and everybody's going to like it because we are here to have fun. That's great. So, so st- still innovating, still, still finding That's- new ways to, to, to make the music accessible to everybody from, from one years old and up. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and I did it one more time since then, but it, was, uh, it wasn't quite as receptive or something. I can't even remember what it was. But I do remember that day and the thinking, boy, we educated these people today, and they applauded with enthusiasm. I told them when the chorus ends, you're supposed to applaud after the solos and applaud at the end of the tune. And if something unusual was going on, like maybe the drummer was taking a solo by himself, I explained how way back there Gene Krupa and other people would just take a long solo, and nobody knew when it was going to end, but they would give a little identifying thing, and then they'd come in. But our drummer knows the form of the tune, and he's going to play exactly X amount of choruses, and we're all going to come in at the right time. Jazz is very organized. Wonderful, wonderful. And I think on that note, I'm going to say goodbye, Jamie, and thank you so much, for, not only for the time today, but this this thing that you've done. <laughs> so obviously, it's not one thing. It's many, 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 many things, one after another after another, but this, this incredible body of work that basically has created a doorway for anybody that loves the music, who wants to get into it and play it. You created this, this doorway for... Uh, very open to young people, old people, people that are just learning, people that are professionals. Everybody can get in and advance themselves the next to the next level. For people that want to follow Jamie's work, one way to do that is to go to jazzbooks.com. You'll see all the books. You'll see information about the camp. And then Google him. There's a lot of good interviews. You mentioned a, a recent one that was done in Indiana r- related to that exhibit. And that's a very, I read that one, uh, very good. I recommend everybody read that. Well, Jamie, thanks for being the educator that you are. We all appreciate it. All of us that love jazz are indebted to you for helping keep our beautiful thing going to the next generations, generations to come. Well, thank you very much, Ken, and I appreciate the opportunity to spread some jazz. Thanks. All righty. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you did, please share it. That's how we grow. And remember to subscribe to jazzonthetube.com, the Internet's largest collection of free, streamable, classic jazz videos.